everybody. Are you able to hear me all right in the back? Perfect. Okay, can I get some shouts? Who here is from Seattle? I heard you represent earlier. Woo! And anyone from the San Francisco Bay Area? Okay, slightly less, but you know, with, uh, I guess you don't have to be as enthusiastic as Seattle when you're not making up for constant drizzle. Coming from both of those areas, I am really appreciative of how Boston is making me feel right at home. And I actually flew in from India, so, you know, I'll take 66 degree weather over 108 degree weather anytime. <laughs> so, I wanted to start today with a question, because I think that questions are very useful in really grounding us with our intentions. And that question is this What is literacy for? What is literacy for? I ask this question because more and more these days, educational attainment is being framed in very narrowly objective-driven terms. I've heard that students should go to college because it leads to getting a job, or boosting the national and global economy, or fulfilling industry demand for skilled labor. I flew to the Pittsburgh airport once and saw this poster, a larger-than-life girl in a lab coat. She was holding a test tube and looming over me next to this text that said, students who get science get jobs. The one-time candidate for the Republican presidential nomination, Marco Rubio, or as someone likes to call him, Little Marco, <laughs> even <laughs> uttered in a debate that America needs, quote, more welders and fewer philosophers, while President Barack Obama commented in a speech, I promise you folks can make a lot more potentially with skilled manufacturing or the trades than with an art history degree, end quote. Florida Governor Rick Scott said, tax dollars should not educate more people who can't get jobs in anthropology. Slightly ironic, because I believe a daughter is an anthropology major, but maybe it was informed by that. <laughs> now, this message, like nothing else in our divisive politics, seems to unfortunately have bipartisan appeal. And I say unfortunately and dangerous, because the message is a dangerous one. Go where the money is. This is dangerous because it's part of a larger trend. One that doesn't see the importance and indeed takes resources away from the humanities and social sciences, both here and abroad. In 2015, more than 50 Japanese universities announced plans to close or take funding away from their humanities and social sciences departments after government officials there urged higher education institutions to offer education that was more practical. All of us are here because we love reading and writing and we want to promote reading and writing. And in that effort, it seems to make sense to fight fire with fire. That is, to tell kids read and write because it's practical, because it's applicable. And both of those things are true, but I've been seeing way too many articles in my newsfeed with titles like, Rich People Like to Read, or The Reading Habits of Ultra Successful People. And I've read a few of these articles, I will admit. I was mainly reading them to look for self-congratulatory pats on the back and assurances that even with my liberal arts degree, I will not be unemployed. But <laughs> what I found was something a little more troubling. These articles advise all the wannabe Mark Zuckerbergs of the world, and believe me, I, I know that we're out there, to consume nonfiction, particularly related to education, career, or self-improvement. It was very specific what all these articles really recommended. Seen through the lenses of practicality and applicability, sure, this makes sense. You're going to see a direct influence in your life earlier from how to win friends and influence people than from Tolstoy's War and Peace. But frankly, I love books too much to see them in the cold and unfeeling terms of return on investment. And I am tired of hearing that we should do things or value things because of the potential financial awards that await us, these pots of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing it because it cheapens learning and it cheapens literacy. Now, I mentioned that I flew in from India and I've been there for the past month because of a summer internship in the corporate social responsibility field. Another uh, couple of Berkeley students are there with me working on different projects, and this is a picture I took on Instagram, my friend Shonak, he's involved with the Literacy Promotion Initiative, and something he told me about his projects, which involve traveling to rural areas and reading the kids and really talking to a lot of them, caught my attention. He said, the whole initiative, it isn't even just literacy per se, it's to teach kids to love reading. And this surprised me, the way he said that, because I'd always heard it discussed in almost this opposite sequence. You teach kids the mechanics of their ABCs first, and then maybe you can do all the fluffy stuff, like getting them to actually like doing it. But then I remembered one of my favorite quotes by Antoine Saint-Exupéry, which I always feel really pretentious saying out loud. <laughs> Three years of high school French there, you know, I have to use it somewhere. 
If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the men to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. This sentiment has held true my entire life. I still remember being three and a half years old. I'm the tiny and cuter one in the middle. <laughs> my sister's in the audience, so I really had to say that. <laughs> and when I was this age and this cute, I still remember curling up with books uh, nestled between my mom and my sister and how unbelieving my mom was when I started reading chapter books a few weeks after I started reading it all. And she actually made me prove that I was actually reading and not just turning the pages. But when I look back at that, I realize that any precociousness, if you can call it that, that I exhibited at an early age with the written word, it wasn't the product of top-down determinations of clinical sounding benchmarks or even overzealous tiger parents. No, I demanded to learn how to read and write because I was bursting at the seams with stories that I couldn't contain any longer and a wanderlust for the infinite worlds that I knew books could spirit me away to. But it is precisely this intrinsic joy that we devalue when we reduce the why of literacy, the answer to that question of what is literacy for, to dollar signs. This justification for teaching the appreciation and understanding of language arts in our schools doesn't just do a disservice to students, it does a disservice to all of society. You see, when students read and write, we gain so much more than a crucial job skill. We learn the language of emotional communication, we feel for people whose lives are nothing like our own. And in doing that, we set ourselves up to be the champions of a kinder and better public discourse. In the work that each and every one of you, <laughs> thank you. In the work that each and every one of you does every single day, I'm confident that you see this potential and often are able to see it realized. But a great challenge lies in communicating this potential to more people beyond this room and to a new generation of readers and writers, giving them a more compelling why than the reading habits of ultra-rich people. <laughs> I want to talk first about the element of emotional communication. I read a great article on relationships. This is one of my pastimes, by the way, when I'm really bored on a plane, I just read relationship articles. <laughs> this article was actually pretty substantial. And it highlighted the necessity of having a language with which to discuss your emotions and how many people end up just sulking in silence and unable to communicate with their partners because they don't really know how to express themselves. And I never thought about that before, how much language plays into our relationships. But it makes sense. Sometimes we give scant attention to the discrepancies in the way that students learn our own language, how many kids can graduate from high school and even college and yet feel unequipped to translate all of the complexities of what they feel into words. Sure, we can't fix this overnight by handing someone a good novel. I wish it that were that easy. I would mail out books to you know, all 300 million people in the US. But so many of our first teachers on our emotions and how to express them are the books we read. When I was a kid, I read this great book called A Bad Case of Stripes. <laughs> Maybe some of you are familiar with it. And it's about a girl whose desire to fit in with school with her friends who hated lima beans and thought they were gross caused her to develop this bad case of stripes. The logical connection was maybe slightly missing, but you don't really care about that when you're, you know, pretty young. And I reread this book over and over again, not just because the illustrations were super rad, but because it spoke to something inside me, something I hadn't quite been able to describe, how sometimes I felt torn between wanting to be like everybody else and how I valued some of the things that made me different. And really, it's easy to find this story heartening, even if you weren't as weird a kid as me. You really could be any kid looking to find their place in a world that doesn't seem like it was built for them. So that was one of the first books that really taught me how to say what I was feeling. And I realized that this is something that really happens for kids everywhere when they start to read. My friend in India told me a story from one of his field visits with rural kids. He met a five-year-old reading a story about a girl who runs away because of being jealous of her sister. And he said, the boy finished the story and scoffs at me and the teacher and is like, why did I read this? He can't relate to it. And so the teacher asks him, have you ever felt jealous in your life? And the boy smiles and says, no, he's super confident he's never felt jealous. And so the teacher brings up a moment when they brought these fried snacks and the kid was angry that he wasn't getting any chutney. And this little moment made the five-year-old realize what jealousy was, and he started going on and on about what he was jealous about. 
literature sparks these conversations. You know, it could have been a story like a bad case of stripes, or it could be a story about a girl being jealous of her sister. Whatever it is, books can set the stage for emotional literacy, and it's not something that stops at the age of five or 10 or 15. As books become more complex and start to deal with harder issues, they again give readers a way to contemplate how the stories they're reading may reflect their own emotional realities. Lisa Feldman Barrett, a professor of psychology at Northeastern University, so right in this area actually, wrote a New York Times article about emotional granularity. Maybe some of you read it. Emotional granularity is essentially the ability to finely tune your feelings. So instead of saying, oh, I feel bad, which is a very general sort of thing, you have more precise emotions like grief, despair, frustration, gloom. This preciseness is actually connected with greater ability to regulate your emotions. That's because, as Professor Barrett writes, um, oops. Your brain, it turns out, in a very real sense, constructs your emotional states. And people who learn diverse concepts of emotion are better equipped to create more finely tailored emotions. This is a skill that people can increase literally by learning new words and their specific meanings. And school children who learn more emotion concepts have improved social behavior and academic performance. When you start reading books like Harry Potter or The Hunger Games, you begin to learn new emotion concepts between the good and bad of our early childhoods. You engage with the feelings that surround trauma and redemption and sacrifice. You engage with moral ambiguities. And this encourages not just emotional literacy in your own life, but also empathy. Now on the subject of empathy, I want to stress how important it is that students are exposed to a wide range of stories and characters, narratives that reflect our myriad diverse communities. I'm going to be blunt. Thanks to a lot of our TV shows, movies, and books, in general, we are already very good at practicing empathy for white boys. As a child, I put myself into the shoes of Prince Caspian and Frodo, Harry Potter, and Huck Finn. I never once questioned the fact that I had never read a book with a protagonist who looked like me, and the stories that I wrote also reflected the misguided idea that half Chinese, half white girls just weren't really cut out to be story character material. The Nigerian author Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie spoke really powerfully about the issue of who we represent, especially in children's literature. She said, I was an early reader, and I read British and American children's books. I was also an early writer, and when I began to write, I wrote exactly the same kinds of stories I was reading. All my characters were white and blue-eyed. They played in the snow. They ate apples. I lived in Nigeria. I had never been outside Nigeria. We didn't have snow. We ate mangoes, and we never talked about the weather. <laughs> if the stories that we encounter Teach us the lesson that only some people get to be represented, only some people get to be empathized with, and we set ourselves up for a society that accepts too easily the trampling of other people's rights. And we accept the trampling of their rights because we can pass it off and say, well, that just happens to other people. Other people, not because they have any less claim to empathy or humanity, but because we learn to see them as other from the gaps in bookshelves where their stories did not appear. This lesson is painfully relevant to our nation right now. I grew up in a predominantly white and Asian suburb near Seattle, and I saw police officers more in our town's annual parade than on street corners. I never felt scared of them. My privileged bubble was too opaque for me to see the specter of police violence looming over communities of color. And then I started school at Berkeley around the same time as the Black Lives Matter movement entered public consciousness. And there were protests in Berkeley in December, my freshman year in college, actually. And armored police officers carrying semi-automatic weapons turned rubber bullets, tear gas, and smoke bombs on unarmed students. And I realized for the first time when I saw people I knew hurt and running what it meant to be scared of the people who were supposed to protect you. And at that same time, I realized that that feeling I had for a night was one that many of my African American classmates and friends had felt their entire lives. I very rarely quote former Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich. <laughs> But he said, in reaction to the events of the past few days, that it is, quote, difficult for white Americans to appreciate how it's more dangerous to be black in America, end quote.
It is profoundly difficult, and not just for white Americans. There are a lot of reasons, but I think that the books we read are part of it. You see, somehow, I went through high school reading not just one, but several books involving white teenage boys in New England boarding schools. I think that there's an entire crate of books about white teenage boys in New England boarding schools that are just you know, parceled off to all parts of the country. But I only read one book with a black protagonist, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston in senior year AP Lit, which is an amazing book. But it wasn't until college that I took an African-American lit class and read books like Between the World and Me, Citizen and American Lyric, and Just Mercy. These are books that need to be required reading in more schools. America needs to work at understanding the suffering of communities of color here at home, and we also need to work at understanding the suffering of communities and parts of the world that we often seem to forget. I say this because of the recent violence in Iraq and Turkey and Saudi Arabia and Bangladesh. And these are events that, when they happen in the Western world, lead us to express our grief in outpourings of support. We declare je suis Paris and we put filters on our Facebook profile pictures. And on some level, I understand. Most of us have been to Paris, if not in person, then in TV or books or our friends' vacation photos. If we have gotten glimpses of places like Iraq and Bangladesh, it's often been through the lens of some weathered war correspondent or documentary filmmaker, countries with security problems that we hear about on NPR in the morning, think how sad, and then forget because those problems affect other people. Except last weekend, suddenly it didn't. You see, two months ago, a girl named Tarishi and I sat next to each other at a table in Berkeley. We were in a two-day orientation session required by the Institute of South Asian Studies on campus, which was sponsoring our internships. I went to New Delhi, and she went to Dhaka. And when I saw the news last weekend that people had been taken hostage in a restaurant frequented by expatriates and killed by armed men, I wasn't worried because I was so used to seeing these things and ha thinking, this happens to other people. But Cherishi was one of them. Professor Lawrence Cohen, who directs Berkeley's Institute for South Asian Studies, said this in a statement on her passing. The target was, in this case, the all-too-familiar figure of the foreigner. Over the past months, the moral and political threat of the foreigner has marked impassioned debate on Brexit in the United Kingdom and the rhetoric of Donald Trump and his calls for bans and walls. Each of these sites of public anxiety toward the foreigner are different radically from one another and from the killings in Dhaka, and yet we need to think about them in complex relation. These are our times, and we must mourn with awareness. In doing so, we might wish to be hesitant and not to rely all too smugly on an easy dismissal of xenophobia or populism. The challenge for all who mourn the violent and cruel loss of Tracy Jane and of her friends is to understand far better than we do the specters of our times and how we must struggle to respond. We must understand far better than we do the specters of our times and how we must struggle to respond. That understanding should not finally begin with some student wandering towards some random class like me with African American lit in freshman year, the, a class that challenges them to think beyond their socioeconomic, ethnic, or national boundaries. It should not finally begin with 30-somethings reading some briefings or report from the Council on Foreign Relations. Understanding starts with the stories we tell our children. And I have to admit, it was only really as I grew older, past the days of a bad case of stripes, that I more proactively sought out books that told different stories. I still remember the first novel I read that was set in India, The Lost Flamingos of Bombay, a really intense novel for a preteen on Google Books. It's described as a Fitzgeraldian world of sex, crime, and politics. My parents didn't really monitor my reading habits. <laughs> Clearly, it was a harsher, more cynical read than I was used to. The world it described was far grittier than Hogwarts, and maybe that's why the book stuck with me. It's a very powerful thing when you cry for tragedies that you have never known, when you cheer on the victories that you have never had to win. It makes you a better person. And I'm not just saying that to stroke my own ego, but because I read it in an article on the internet, so it must be true. <laughs> A Time Magazine article entitled, Why We Should Read Literature. And a psychologist at York University in Canada and a professor of cognitive psychology at University of Toronto reported that individuals who often read fiction appear to be able to better empathize with people and view the world from their perspective. And a 2010 study found a similar result 
with young children. The more stories they had read to them, the keener their theory of mind or mental model of other people's intentions. The vital nature of building this empathy is keenly illustrated by this year's election cycle. That we can even have a candidate of a major party receive support after expressing blatantly discriminatory, xenophobic, and misogynistic views is reflective of a systemic failure to inculcate empathy in tandem with literacy. Because it is worth remembering that the people who killed my schoolmate in Bangladesh were affluent. They were the sons of elite families who attended elite schools. And the American police officers responsible for the deaths of black men and women who did not deserve to die could certainly read, and probably so could the snipers in Dallas. I bring this up because I used to believe that you could build a school, hand someone a book, and solve all the problems of the world. And I now realize that education alone is not enough. Education with intention matters deeply to building the world we want to see. If somebody knows how to read and write, but uses that ability to spread hatred and divisiveness, I see a failure somewhere in their past by a parent, a mentor, a community member, a peer, to imagine an answer to what is literacy for, broader than the immediate objectives of passing through school and getting a job. I see a failure to remember that literacy and love must always go together, a lesson that we forget at our own peril. Teaching a child to read and write well is about so much more than economic necessity. It is about giving them the ability to feel something for someone whose life is nothing like what they know. Giving them the words to describe their emotions, the experience of wading through the murky waters of moral ambiguities and the grayest of gray areas. It is about making everyone a little less other because we live in a nation whose strength has always been rooted in diversity. You know, there's a memorial sort of near Faneuil Hall for the Irish immigrants who fled here during the potato famine to make a better li life in the US. And surrounding these statues of men, women, and children are plaques that describe the extent of the hunger in Ireland. One says that the starving there would sometimes be found dead by the side of the road with their mouths stained with grass because of last ditch efforts to stay alive. And this is horrifying, and so is the description of how these immigrants were treated when they first arrived in the US, the days of no Irish need apply signs in businesses' windows. So I was looking at these statues and reading these plaques and feeling a sense of despair about how little has changed in our world. But then I recalled that poem by Emma Lazarus, The New Colossus, and its oft-repeated lines, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. They're the words on the Statue of Liberty, and thinking of those words in that moment gave me hope, because you see, whether they're lines in poems or stories in books, words can have a way of beckoning us toward a better future, a future that does not yet exist. I believe in a world where every young person knows that they, too, can be authors of the human story, that they can add lines, that those lines can contribute to fairness and justice and peace. So I ask again, what is literacy for? All of this and all of us. Thank you so much for everything you do.